want to get put into the farm. Who is this big group? It's people from all across the country. It's farmers, environmentalists, consumer wow. groups, researchers. That's the name of It's a campaign, and we don't even have a name yet. We're trying to figure out what is a name that makes sense. I'm calling it this, these, you know, sustainable agriculture campaign is what I'm calling it when I talk about it. So uh, the, this is the latest. This is where we're at right now. Some of this may change. But on number one, that was a very popular one that a lot of people really were excited about, where we would – it would involve um, increasing net family farm income through increasing non-recourse loan rate. Find yet? That's not real clear. But that really large farms and also people that have really high incomes that aren't really farm related. Some of those people are getting payments from that program that maybe. to take some of that money and direct it toward these green payments, which is that bottom point on number one, what they're calling green payments, which would be rewarding farmers for implementing whole farm resource protection plans. So that if you do more environmentally sound farming, um, you could get some financial support from the federal government for that. You could get a reward for that. And it would, it would make people you know, more inclined to, to do that. And this can involve you know, preserving sensitive areas of your farm, like if you have wetlands, not developing that, or um, other things that are listed in more detail here, but that's the basic idea. And this really excited a lot of the environmental groups and a lot of the large uh, uh, commodities farmers, and so it brought them together in unity. Um, and I noticed in the, I don't know if this agrees with what that Farm Bureau article said that, um, was being passed around, but it seemed that the Farm Bureau was also saying that in some areas they would like to work more hand-in-hand -hand with the environmental enhancement programs in the Farm Bill, so maybe we'll have an ally on this. I don't know. Um, the second one is a whole different kind of angle on things. It's looking at using uh, USDA programs, designing them so that they provide more support in rural communities for uh, locally for local uh, farmers and so that you can um, perhaps set up small processing plants for your product and get some help on doing that so that there won't be so many barriers to doing that which can bring more income into the community and strengthen the community um, it also uh, offers more support for urban gardening and agriculture and a whole range of other ideas for sort of redirect redirecting the rural development idea that USDA has been working on up till now um, into more sustainable agriculture programs in local communities. The number three is imp very important. Uh, farms at a rate three times faster than non-minority farmers historically, and so they're in a crisis too. And there aren't that many minority or African-American farmers even left now. Uh, so this would basically provide more supports for them and more technical assistance and more educational outreach to, to African-Americans and other minorities that are trying to uh, be successful in farming but are really struggling. It also provides uh, some more support for farm workers who have a pretty hard way to go also. Um, I'm going really quickly because this is such a long time. I just wanted to touch on some things to get you think, and then you could ask me anything you want to know at our last part of the session. Um, number four, total farm resource planning. That's an idea where policies that would encourage comprehensive farm planning um, would be established, and farmers would be encouraged to do this, and there would be some incentive. plan and figure out the environmental impact of what they're doing and how to do the best job of being good stewards of the land um, and in improving their soil and protecting their water at the same time being successful farmers and that's a real tricky thing to do and so this would provide 
assistance with making a plan to help you have a successful farm. Um, there's, there's, uh, I'm going to skip number five. It's pretty complicated. It has a lot to do with GAT and what happens with that. Number six um, would uh, increase funding for some programs that already exist, but they're not getting enough funding. And what they do is uh, they help farmers find cost-effective solutions to dealing with water problems on their farms. So a lot of this is helping support farmers to do the, who want to do the right thing and who want to change some of their methods. Because there are so many farmers that want to do that, but they either can't get the information on how to do it, or or they don't, you know, they don't know where to, who to look to for help. And and this even provides uh, cost-sharing measures where there's some financial support. So we have combined a lot of those ideas with. Uh, some other ideas that deal with redirecting what research and extension is doing, and we've touched on that a lot today. And number seven gets into it a little bit. So it is number 11, where we're trying to get research and extension programs to support family farming and environmental quality. Um, in number 11, this uh, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, that's called the SARE program. Some of you are probably familiar with that. We want to make sure that gets reauthorized. In other words, that that's funded again at a good amount for the next period, of the next five years. We're ready and for number nine. I'll go back to number nine in just a moment. <laughs> and then uh, I wanted to point out that in number 11, something would be involved in that would be providing some training for extension agents with so that they can learn more about sustainable agriculture and that there would be more money directed toward research on sustainable ag so that these things don't just keep getting ignored by an, an extension um, kind of going at it from just one angle. We want to see that changed and a lot of farmers really feel like they want to see that changed. So it's sort of like giving them a new mission. You want me to talk about number nine? That is uh, asking that, well you can see what it says, that all milk produced by cows receiving BGH have a label on it so that when you go to the store, you know whether or not your milk has had your has been treated with that. Did you want to comment, discuss, or argue, or mention anything? Well, I've already written on this. I, I think you know the Federal Register has already printed regulations that this may have, this milk cannot be labeled that it contains uh -huh. or does not contain uh, this chemical uh -huh. producing thing. And of course, this is a thing that is put in there by the chemical companies and huge dairies like the one in Tucson, Arizona, where if you line their calves up, they would go from here to Alexandria without a break. They, they have that many calves, so they, they, they can do it automatically. And not only is there a surplus enough production now, why do we want to do this with a chemical that we don't know anything about? Uh, yeah, the I, dairy I farmers don't, they, they feel like a lot of the small dairy farmers don't want it because it makes the surplus even larger, which makes their prices go down. Made, and then a lot of consumers don't want it because they don't trust it. It's dairies that will devastate the, dairy, uh, the small dairy Right. Farmers. Do you work in dairy yourself? No. Yeah, that's what I hear from the dairy farmers I've talked to. The small dairy farmers say exactly what you're saying. So in this one, if we could label the stuff, then I guess the idea is that consumers would, a lot of people would be less likely to buy it and it would just have be a discouragement for, at for least using. We have the choice of yeah. buying what we want to buy. Now one state, Vermont, just had a big So apparently I know well, about that ruling. Yeah, but yeah. apparently states can pass their own laws, which I didn't know. And um, Well if it remains in trust state. Pardon? If it's in trust state. Okay. Yeah. So it would be Vermont produced milk? That they would stay in Vermont. Right. I'm, and that's a big dairy state. I this is an assumption, but that's usually uh -huh. the way uh -huh. the rules go. It doesn't cross any okay. state lines. Okay. Then the state makes to make the rules. No, but I think they're requiring that any milk sold in the state, even if it comes from outside the state, would have to be labeled. I think that's I, now that might run, run afoul. What's the difference in some of the interstate commerce clause? But as long as it's produced in the state and, and it's sold in the state, then that could be no problem. I would think. What's the sum of the right uh, On number eight, dairy policy, that would be. Um, 
of sort of setting up a supply management system so that farmers get a more fair price for their milk um, based on the cost of production instead of uh, every year finding they're getting less for their, their milk while the consumer is paying more at the store. So it's, it's, a, it's a simple concept. I have no idea how controversial it will be once it gets into Congress and so on, but the, dairy, the small dairy farmers really need this. Um, number 10 would be strengthening USDA programs that reduce conversion of farmland to non-farm development. So we would be preserving some land, some farmland instead of continually eating it up with more developments. That's the, my general understanding. Again, you know, you could get in all these details here, and this is only part of the details. There's a longer version of this. So when people write this into the bill, it's going to have an explanation of how you do these things. But since I'm not working on all of these, and we would take too long to talk about the details of, well, how are you going to do that? But people are working on it. Every one of these 20 things has its own committee of grassroots people, and that combined with experts, and all kinds of people in between that are working on developing these ideas so that we'll have the most chance of winning. We're not just sending out some flaky ideas. This is a really well-planned campaign that we think can do some good. You're saying that each one has standards, because I was concerned about good stewardship and the rewards. Mm -hmm. How can I find out what the details are of that? Okay, which, what number so I can remember more? Well, if you sign up on my list that I pass around and you make a note to me, then I'll, I'll get information to you. And I'll do that for anybody. But you make any notes on that list you want. I'll start passing it around now just so it starts moving. Um, number 12, uh, the idea here is pretty big. It's to get USDA to just recognize sustainable agriculture all the way across the board more than it has been and to develop, to have kind of a coordinator that, that pulls it together more instead of having it be a little bit of this and that spread all over the department. Number 13, pest management and pesticide education. Strengthening USDA programs that assist farmers to reduce their pesticide use. <coughs> it includes things like uh, helping them get information about how, you, how do you do it. I mean, how do you do biological controls? What is integrated pest management? What are some other practices I can do on my farm that makes me use less pesticides? And there are a lot of things out there, but a lot of farmers don't know where to get the information. So, again, there are some programs that are supposed to be doing that, but they're kind of getting the short end of the stick and they're not getting well funded. We're just, a lot of these things are already in the 1990 Farm Bill, but they, weren't, they aren't being implemented, they aren't being done, and they aren't being funded. So a lot of what we're talking about here is strengthening what we got in 1990. 1990 was the first time this sustainable agriculture got put into the Farm Bill, and a lot of these programs, that's what this is, and, but a lot of them didn't really get funded, because just because they get written down doesn't mean they're going to get much money, and every year that Appropriations Committee I mentioned that Johnston is on votes on how much money to give everything, and with the tight budget, uh, a lot of things get, get, don't get much. Other required labeling, number 14, that would mean that uh, anything that is a food that you buy that's genetically engineered, like the new tomatoes they're coming up with. I don't know much about, gen someone else may speak up about this, but they're changing, can anybody explain genetically engineered in a quick way? I know the food doesn't taste anyways. That's right, <laughs> that's right, that's a quick way. Um, but things that are genetically engineered or irradiated, that they would have to have a label on them that says this has been done to this food so that you can make a choice at the store. And it was talking about what uh, that E. coli, that E. coli, E. coli, that was Yeah, yeah. Um, and also they're talking about labeling where the food came from. They're calling it, it's called point of origin labeling. So that if you're getting um, some strawberries from Chile that have been sprayed, with DDT because maybe and maybe in that country they don't really ban DDT. You would know where your strawberries came from instead of having to guess. Did they come from California, Florida, or are they local? Um, Fifteen is this conservation reserve program where, which I can't explain very well. It has a lot. It's I guess it's more in practice out west with large pieces of land. Um, 
highly erodible land can be protected and farmers can get paid for not growing on it. And so this deals with uh, figuring out how to continue that after the 10-year contracts run out, as far as I can tell from this. Number 16, that's a small technicality, I guess, where they're trying to, to change. I can't explain it very well. There were some penalties that got put into the 1990 bill, and it's not working out well, and they're trying to get them out of there to help these farmers out. The penalties go against farmers, and, and you know, it's hard for me to understand that concept because I haven't lived out in that area of the country and don't know a lot about it. But the people out there, it's a high priority for them. 17, we're trying to figure out a way, and this isn't very well fleshed out, to make it possible for new people to go into farming. And there's only one sentence here under number 17, but that committee's working on it, so I don't know what, what it's going to turn out to be, but it's a good idea. Um, 18, again, is addressing things with extension programs and making them more responsive to sustainable agriculture, small farmers' needs who are trying to use less chemicals and develop new practices um, and coordinate you know, the research that's happening so that when research is done in one area of the country that other uh, extension agents know about it and can tell the farmers about it. 19, agricultural bargaining says it's to allow farmers who produce on contract for big corporations to bargain with the corporations about what their price is going to be and give them the right to form cooperatives for this bargaining and not get uh, penalized because right now if you do that a lot of times as a uh, contract grower say if you grow chickens for a big corporation and you try to argue <laughs> about the contract they'll just say well you don't have to grow for us goodbye so these folks are trying to get together and kind of form uh, something not really a union but a way to have more power in dealing with these big corporations that are taking over the whole poultry industry the last one kind of came up today and it's we're calling it chemical trespass it has to do with Finding a way, and this is going to be very, this is probably legally really difficult, but to create some enforceable way to protect farmers from pesticide drift. Suppose you're, you're growing your crop and then somebody else's pesticides get carried by air or something onto your crop. If you're an organic grower, as was mentioned just a moment ago, that could mess you up for a three-year period. You could become automatically all your work, you'd have to wait three years before you'd even be legitimate again. Um, and of course, you can see a lot of other problems that can come from this. A couple of states have actually passed this, a law like this, and we're looking at that, Washington State and somewhere else out west, but it's tricky. It's hard to know how to do it. So that's being worked on. And there's one more that's not on here. There, the, there's, there is a small committee trying to work on getting transition, a transition label which came up just a moment ago, for farmers that are transitioning to organic. They're slowly changing their practices to where they're doing all that whole list of practices that was held up um, and becoming really organic so that when you go to the store and you see, you, you know, things are labeled organic, it has a specific meaning now. You can't just label anything organically grown. Well, now there, this idea would be to have another label that says tr something about tr this farm is in transition, so it's sort of like halfway organic. So you know what you're getting, and if you buy it, you're supporting that farmer in making that transition. Yes. Okay, would this transition act also, uh, like, let's say you've never grown anything on that piece of property, then it wouldn't necessarily have pesticides that should be there. So it's only if you transition from one type of garden to another. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. Do you know? Yeah, if, not, if, if pesticides not, have not been used. You can use a label of a Yeah. Yes. Okay. So these are the these are the this is the essence of what we're working for. Does anybody want to talk about this, or we're about ready to wrap this part up? I think we're ready, Julie, to just open it up to questions, if that's okay, and for which you can be a part of it. That's great. If anybody had a question for Jay or Mr. Neighbors, Wilma, Helen, or anything? I think I just want, I'd like to say one thing about this. Um, sure. Go ahead. I mean, I, this is probably one of the most important things that we can focus on because it's eliminating a lot of the disincentives that are now in place to make the transition and to move away from chemical dependent agriculture. This, you mentioned the base, uh, the removing the commodity program penalties on resource conserving crop rotations and 
you know, the whole concept of base acreage, which locks farmers into a certain production level for certain commodities, can be a disincentive to an organic cotton production. Or, well, organic, I don't know if it would have to be um, a commodity program that fit under the program, but it can serve as a disincentive to move into uh, commodities that you might not meet that base acreage on. So, in other words, if you set the base oh. acreage differently, you might not have to use pesticides to meet that that uh, yield that is required. Oh, or that's or part you of might not have to put as much acreage into um, that particular crop. So policies like that, which are you know set up in Washington D.C. far away from home, I think can create a tremendous disincentive. And what what this is about is eliminating those disincentives and facilitating the alternative. And also, as new technologies develop, like the genetically engineered foods, which is really m changing the genetic makeup of plants and incorporating other genes from other plants, <coughs> which has all kinds of potential adverse effects, or genetic uh, introducing a um, pest-resistant uh, gene or pesticide-resistant gene into a plant. I mean, the implications of that are, are potentially tremendous. Um, the whole point here is to make the consumer aware that this is going on. So as a consumer, I think we can buy into practices or support those practices which are um, environmentally sound and appropriate. So I think from that standpoint, it's, it's almost like it's suggesting let's not have the regulatory system have built-in disincentives for alternatives. Right now, the regulatory system um, pushes farmers in one direction, and it tends to be a chemical-dependent direction. So, and this this agenda would would hopefully, I think, its intent is to relieve that and change that. Well, I just make a statement though. Uh, the knife has been brought up several times in this, and I think quite a few people here are totally unfamiliar yes, with knife. LSU Ag Center has an active research program going on with, with them, as well as a marketing and what have you down in San Gabriel. Uh, what is it, it is a, a possibility of a fiber that can use to be used for making paper. Uh, we have an active program going on right now with some people in uh, industry as an absorbent. It's, uh, the uh, research is going on on the uh, sugar cane experimentation because it is a cane type product Although the major problem with it when it was first raised in Mississippi, the experiment station, is that its leaves look exactly like marijuana no. leaves. And a couple of people broke into the Mississippi station and stole it. <laughs> Ended up in the hospital because it closes your throat down. Oh, if you oh smoke it, it'll go, nah. Oh. So you, if you smoke if they smoke it, don't even do it once. <laughs> but there is, it, it's, it's very, I maybe agree with that. I don't know how much you know about what we're doing now. But I think it offers some possibilities of an alternative crop, not that we would totally ever replace pulpwood and some of the other stuff, but it's, we are always looking for alternative crops, and this is one that is an active research program. Where is it from? Where does it come from? It's a free enterprise system. It is an economic-driven and market-driven type of thing. We can grow canop right here. We have done research with canop right here. You will not grow it without some use of pesticides. There's just diseases or, or particular problems with it. It makes a high quality, a higher quality of paper than uh, we normally make with, with pulp. Meat. But um, there has to be a market for you know you can can grow something and sustain it. A non-profitable system is not a sustainable system. And agriculture as we know it in this part of the world at this point in time is not a sustainable system without the use of pesticides. The Louisiana Agricultural Experiment Station, uh, I managed two of them, one 10 miles down the road that I'd love to have somebody leave here and go with me and I'll spend the rest of the day, I can talk as long as, as Feldman can talk. <laughs> about some of, some of I, don't know, I, I don't know who I'd bet on. Yeah, uh, <laughs> technology got us where we where we are. Technology is the reason we have the quality of life that permits us to meet here this afternoon with, with 
full stomachs and, and clothed and, and fed and worry about the quality of life <coughs> while a lot of other people are worrying about where they're going to get food. There's some disadvantages to technology. We're looking at those. We're trying to develop new technology all of the time to overcome the disadvantages of the current technology. But the facts are these. We use less pesticides in the production of crops in Louisiana per acre right now than we did when I entered this business 26 years ago. Less pounds per acre. That's a fact. And those that we use are less toxic than the ones we used a few years ago. And the type of technology that Mr. Feldman is afraid of now uh, is going to lead us to another plateau. We're working with cottons that have a gene in them that have been genetically engineered to kill the budworm and tobacco, uh, bollworm and tobacco budworm. That will greatly reduce the quantities of pesticides that we need to use to control those two major pests. Uh, the herbicides uh, resistant crops that he refers to. Uh, that happens to be my particular area of, of expertise. I'm a weed scientist. <coughs> The Roundup resistant crops that we're working with are going to permit us to reduce production costs, to use a very environmentally and, and toxicologically benign product to grow a crop, and it's going to increase the competitiveness, the profitability of our farmers, it's going to reduce environmental degradation. Those same pesticides are permitting us to reduce soil erosion rates on our making wood station from 16 tons an acre to less than one ton per acre. So the substitution of some of these herbicides for some of the tillage that we've been doing is the most environmentally friendly thing, desirable thing that could possibly happen. So we don't have to fear technology to the extent that I'm afraid my friend fears it. Uh, well, he's not alone. No, I think he speaks for a lot. Well, for I, a I lot know that. For me also. I, I, I think would like to discuss it with you that, that I think our, a lot of people fear it to the extent of being paranoid about it. And I think that is unjustified and, and that, that bothers me as a person who has helped to, to do the research to develop a lot of that. Well, yes, ma'am. Uh, you talk about pesticides, um, you talk about facts. The facts are that uh, people who work with these types of chemicals do is going to disappear because the pesticides do. <laughs> it's totally illogical. Throughout the history of the world, farmers have formed the land way before pesticides ever came. And they will again but not farm this land. With the number of people, they do prefer the laziest, the easier food. You know, there's a very, very with, different world. With the number of people that can work the farms and the number of people that can be, it has gone on substantially throughout the history. But I understand what you're saying. There's less of a crop waste, so there's more economical value. There's less farmers because of it. And that's one of the reasons I think farmers have gone out of business over the years, is also because this large farm can produce more on his small acre and sell it and get rid of it and feed more people. But pesticides are still not the answer. They're, they're not the total answer. We're working with crops that have natural host fat resistance. You know, the, the two, another statement that was made today, and Mr. Feldman made it, I have never talked to a farmer that did not want to reduce the pesticides that he used on, on the farm. The farmer that was spraying on those school kids. Well, you know, we all have black eyes, and I won't defend what, what that person did, but the technology that I helped develop, the, the instructions that went with that technology told him not to do that. So that person is not a representative of the agricultural community, and I Yes, I apologize for it, but that's not the normal type of situation. Uh, I lost what I was going to say. <laughs> well, was I, I, I eat the same food, I guess. You know, I, I work around pesticides. I work.
destroying society. Uh, I'm a human being. I think I'm a pretty good Christian guy. I think what I'm doing is making this world a better place to live. Uh, and I wouldn't unleash yeah. Armageddon on this world. I don't mind you saying that you're Christian and you have to live off the food, but to say that it's making this world a better place, I cannot believe that you can make a statement regarding how if you remove them, there will be many other people that will starve to death. If you look at the demographics of the world, uh, if we remove pesticide from production, the gentleman this morning mentioned the DDT, uh, and there are millions of people's lives that were saved by the use of that to control malaria. Now, I, I don't advocate bringing DDT back because I know there's some adverse effects about it. We have better technology than that now. So there's, uh, we can't live in, in a zero risk world it never has been a zero risk for it. But I assure you that there are agricultural research scientists in all of the experiment stations in the United States and throughout the world that, that are diligently trying to make this world a better place to live. See, I disagree with that. I feel like the education should be to the There are millions and billions. Their numbers are immense. And they are the ones that need the education. But not so much me, and obviously not so much my the other point, I guess, you know, it's not just the agricultural community that has been impacted by consolidation. And the loss of family farms, that hurts me as much as it hurts you. I, I don't like that part of what I have watched uh, happen to, to agriculture in my lifetime in this business. That our young people are having to leave and we're going to bigger, you know, more heavily mechanized. But economics drives that. That's a sociological problem. That's not a farmer problem. That's not a problem that I can address, address directly. But I think groups of people like we have here today discussing those negative things and trying to identify ways to, to overcome that. But the, the bottom line is agriculture is not the only one, uh, only industry that has been faced with this bigger is better and, and buying more, more costly, more expensive technology to reduce the cost of people and the cost of employees. And that, that was addressed this morning. There's a lot more than just uh, direct cost of an employee, there's a tremendous liability with having a person work for you now. There are tremendous cost fringe benefits to, to protect that person and so forth. So the loss of jobs, the, the bigness in agriculture, uh, I have very mixed emotions about that. But I know we're not going back to the day when we were, we're going to grow very much organic cotton. This gentleman talked about where we're going to spend $150 an acre hand holding because people will refuse to do those kinds of jobs in the society that we're in. They will not do that. Paul, I think you wanted to share something with the group before we left. Well, just to bring out again, it's already been discussed. Um, I mean, I don't think we need to really get in debates and polarize this thing again. Of, I'm for pesticides, I'm against pesticides. Um, but it is recognized that there are specific ones that are associated uh, with cancer, with birth defects, reproductive problems, neurological problems. There's new reports, uh, especially from the Academy of Science this year, that point out... Uh, Just for a minute, guys, please be quiet. Just for a few minutes, let us speak, thank you. How, how the legal standards that we've had very uh, vastly underestimate the effect of pesticides, especially on children, because of their smaller body size, the fact that they eat a lot more fruits and vegetables, they process them differently. So we really have to look at the safety factor. Uh, the new administration says that we need to go back to that standard. There's always this economic debate, uh, but we need to go back to the basic standard that safety of the public is more important than the economic or business interest. And that should be our bottom line. Does survival come into that equation? Well, of course, you really okay. can't separate the two. Okay, you know? because, because somewhere in there, survival has got to come into that equation and just what impact these changes may have. Well, survival includes the whole the quality of life thing, which is not only your income, but your health. Yeah. And we really have to look at uh, especially protecting the children. One so uh, there, there are a couple of bills in Congress right now that are really drawing a lot of interest. Uh, we're working with a lot of concerned consumers here in the state and across the country uh, to support a new bill that's come out that will phase out specific chemicals. Now, we're not trying to eliminate all pesticides, 
but they're those that are known to be high-risk chemicals uh, that are probable or known carcinogens would be phased out within five years and really reevaluate <coughs> the safety of all of them. And I don't think that anybody could argue that that's point of not fact. A point of fact. Point of fact. EPA has no pesticides that are known human carcinogens in Category A. There are there are seven, no pesticides. In there category are seventy-five A. chemicals that are not in A. Known or probable. Not in A. No. Not it's known. known well, well, no, let's separate. Let's don't put them together. A or B. Mm -hmm. Known or probable. That's none in category A as known human carcinogens. Is going to buy chocolates, expose him his Have not been fully tested for cancer. Well, so I'm the going law, I'm to say right, right now, as, 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 as of right now, the law will phase out when chemicals are tested, they will phase out all known and probable. That's what the law will do. We have not fully tested all chemicals. But all I'm cancer. asking is just and to so be she's just telling now. what the law does. The okay, law so will phase out right now. She is, it, she's it, being perfectly it, accurate. Yeah. She's saying the law will phase out all known and probable human carcinogens. <laughs> When the chemicals are fully tested, chem the vast majority, as I showed you this morning, and you don't dispute that, no, the, the, vast majority the vast majority of chemical pesticides have never been fully tested. There are, lot, there are large cancer. numbers who have been totally tested. I could agree with that. It's the vast correct. majority. Not large majority. numbers have not we only, been we only tested have about as some of the newer chemicals have. We have about 30 chemicals now out of nearly 700 that have been fully <laughs> tested and are under EPA's re-registration eligibility document um, program. Like so the, she's, she's perfectly correct in saying that the bill will phase out all known and probable human carcinogens when the chemicals are fully tested yeah. under yeah. the law. Chemicals currently, currently we just banned the last known human carcinogen that you refer to, which is arsenicals. Um, and the rest are probable currently, but the law will require that all known and probables will be phased out when they are fully tested. And, and that's wanna, perfectly correct. Yeah, I want to speak up as a mother because this gets very academic among the folks that you deal with these things yeah, every day. I mean, as a mother goes to a store, when you tell me probable or known, and it's not a class A, it's just a class B, to the majority of people that means nothing. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and I think that's what the uh, cotton farmers are saying, is that community layman people, moms and people who have, we, we buy with, you know, go to the store and buy things, want to buy things that we're reassured is as healthy as we can, ex can get. Okay? And, and that's going to be a definition that's different for everybody. I, I'm not going to be really happy, you know, if it's a class B. You understand what I'm saying? And so our money has to talk. So I, I get really upset when, when we do get polarized here on, on risk. I think risk is going to become more and more an arena of debate to separate us rather than draw us together about what we can do to actually reduce all of us from the risk that we're facing. You see, and, and, it get, and I think the argument gets too academic and not real life because for you who are academics, you know, that's wonderful, and we should have an arena where just you all talk. But when layman people are involved, I think that we feel pretty powerless about it. You know, I, I feel that we don't thoroughly understand it, and that's why we're glad you're here, so you can explain it to us. You cannot understand it because it is a very technical thing. I don't understand all of it. I'm, I'm not a, uh, a toxicologist, but I think we have to trust. You know, I don't understand how to fix my car. I take it to a mechanic when it breaks down to, to fix it, or I take it to somebody else. I don't understand yeah, all aspects of it. Well. But you no, know, the re-registration process yes. is removing pesticides very quickly. It's removing some of the older ones, and that is causing some problems within our society, particularly for some of the, the smaller crops, because no <coughs> one will go to the expense of, of retesting and re-registering some of those to the, to the extent that's required now. So we're losing some things that, that are very safe and are very beneficial. And all that's going to be reflected in, in increased cost in, in the products that, that you buy. But, you know, we're never going to live in a zero-risk world. And another, you know, we need to remember that the most 
toxic compounds that are known. And Mary, I think you, Dr. Godner, you can verify to control some of those, that's the most deadly toxins that are known. And if you allow insects to feed on that and provide entrance for some of those diseases, the food you eat now, I swear, is safer than any food that anybody has ever eaten before. Can I say I mean, something? I really hate to see you, you keep coming across as being very defensive, and that's not necessary. Well, that's the way you are. We may not ever live in a zero risk world, but we don't have to accept unnecessary risk. The way the legal risk standards are evaluated now for each of these chemicals is based on as if these chemicals were used one at a time and you eat one food at a time. And that has nothing to do with reality. There's a great overlap. Oftentimes you have as many as eight pesticides used on one food. You have a plate full of food with the vast variety of well, accumulation of those pesticides on the same plate. And when you're looking at kids, especially, that are being exposed, then that, that safety level that has or has not been measured officially uh, is greatly compounded. So it's not as simple as you would say, that this has been guaranteed that th there's just a minimal risk factor in there. You said third. safe. It's are, are, you, third. are you a safe uh, official? Or are you? I'm here today as a private citizen. I realize that, but in your in your work, you work for the I city. I have considerable expertise in agricultural research. And I say this with all due respect, but I think it's very inappropriate. And if you're if you were in a different circle, pro possibly illegal, to to make the statement that the pesticides that are coming off the market because the manufacturers are not subjecting their chemicals to re-registration are perfectly safe. I did not say that. I don't believe. I said you said these are very good product. chemicals that are perfectly yeah, safe coming off the market. We've got to be very careful, especially with farmers, I believe, in addition to consumers, because we as a society have not committed the resources or enforced the laws that have required full testing. So we. We don't know, even though, a far, I meet a lot of farmers who say, look, I've used this thing for 40 years, I've never had any health problems, you know, me personally, with the use of this chemical. And then EPA tests it and they find all these problems with it. We don't, and everyone has different risk factors and everyone, you know, experiences things differently. Our life, they're, they're trying to get a handle on the eight chemicals that are on the one pesticide. The point is that that's why when I sit and listen to the Extension Service from Missouri talk about the alternative and the, the idea that we can move in the direction of finding alternatives, I don't still un understand what the resistance is. There is no resistance. Yeah, in, in the I don't know what the, the Extension Service, I don't know what the resistance is either. Who, who made this statement? There is an attitude popular in some quarters that we can grow our food organically without the use of pesticides. While it is a notion that makes for great hype, it makes for a very f poor food product. Do you know who said that? No, I didn't know who said that. Commissioner, what's his first name? Bob, but we have Bob Odom. We have differences of opinion. With I do not work for the Louisiana <laughs> Department of Agriculture and Forestry. Okay. Mary made that real clear when she came but, in. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, we need to stop criticizing each other. I mean, yeah. I, in the sense that if you believe genetically engineered is the way to go, do your research. If there's some organic no. folks over here that are developing a market successfully and doing what it takes, I don't care how much hoeing they're doing, if they're doing something that's environmentally sound, let them be. Let them do their research. Did I criticize him? I don't care. Well, I get the feeling. With it. I just I admire the just fact that he's a good man. We, and we will also assist them as, as extension educators. We will also assist them as far as we can.
if it is profitable, it will grow. That is the reason I ask him the question, how many acres can we get? Well, if we can get a dollar and a quarter a pound, hey, we can make a half. We can cut a 50% right. yield. But we can't sell much of it. And we can't grow 11 million acres a pound. You and I may be able to sell the fair space. I want to thank everybody. Oh, Paul, do you want to finish? Can Paul make one more point? Then we're going to thank y'all for coming. You can go out in this beautiful sunshine for the rest of the day and ho or not ho. I have as big a problem with the dude on the other side who says, I've been using these chemicals for 30 years and they never have that makes me see red all the I have one question. Anybody wondering why a lot of them why? What's it going for? If I knew where you were going, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take it. Here you go, Mr. Rogers. You can put your complaint. You too, Mrs. Dr. Marin. Not you. That's a great song. That's a great song. That's a great song. Beautiful. Thank you. No, seriously, I have any problem.